Good morning. Welcome to Sovereign Grace Baptist Church this morning. Uh, just a couple of announcements before we uh, begin. Uh, last Sunday morning, I had uh, suggested a couple of books to you, and I was shocked that nobody came to get them, and so I'm going to promote them again. I don't think you realize how good these books are. And uh, this one here, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, if you have not read this book, you need to read this book. And it's only $9.45. Not asking you to sell all you have and give it to the poor. I'm just saying $9.45, and this will enrich your life till the day God calls you home. So I highly recommend that to you. And this is the last one of this particular one. We can order more, but Concise Theology uh, is a great book to um, uh, help you to understand Christian theology. If you read the scriptures faithfully, and you immerse yourself in a book like this, you will have a good understanding of Christian theology. This one's only $18.90. And if you can have a deep understanding of Christian theology for 20 bucks, it doesn't get much better than that, does it? So if you've got those, talk to Dale, and, uh, and, and you, you need to run for these. This is the last one, all right? Anybody? I thought you wanted to take them. Cool, there you go. All right, then Dale will order some more for the next. We make no money off of those, just to make it clear. Everything's sold at cost, so there's no, there's no marketing here, except for Dale's cut. But other than that, there's no marketing. So, uh, A couple of other announcements. Uh, Wednesday evening for the summer, our children's program is um, over for the summer. Uh, last Wednesday, we kind of had our final party together here at the church. But we want to encourage everybody to keep coming on Wednesday night from 6.30 to 7.30 for prayer meeting. Uh, Neil's going to finish up Hebrews over the next uh, few weeks. And then we're going to spend six or seven weeks doing an overview of the book of Romans. So we certainly encourage you to continue coming Wednesday evening. And next Sunday, we have a fellowship meal. And after the fellowship meal at one o'clock, this is another exciting thing. One o'clock, monasticism. All right, right here. We're going to talk about the beginnings of monasticism in the church. Don't roll your eyes, ladies at the back. All right. This is exciting stuff. And you should be here for this. I mean, you missed the canon of scripture last time. And you could have, you lost that benefit, but you can jump on board now and, and uh, learn about monasticism. So I highly recommend that to you. Also, as you know, there's been some moves that have been taking place and um, Don and Grace have been moved out. Neil and Crystal are moving in. Tomorrow morning, 10 o'clock, Neil's gonna have the truck at his place. So if you're able, the hands are needed to fill the truck, bring all the stuff over to well, I guess it's Neil and Crystal's house now, not Donna Grace's anymore, and then uh, help to unload. So 10 o'clock tomorrow morning, Neil's house, as many hands would certainly would help with that. All right, any other announcements that need to be mentioned this morning? Let's take our Bibles and turn over to Psalm 33. Psalm 33, and we'll worship the Lord together with a reading of this psalm. Neil, after I read this, maybe you could come up and lead us in prayer this morning. Psalm 33. <coughs> Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the heart of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot be rescued. It cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may 
deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield, for our heart is glad in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Let's pray. Father, you are good to us. Lord, we know that uh, we are not worthy of the grace that you shower upon us. We're not worthy of the mercy that you show us, Lord, and yet you are a God who loves us, who endures with long suffering and patience our various failures and shortcomings. And Lord, as we come here with a wearying week behind us, Lord, we can just look to you and see how you have provided for us. We thank you, Lord, that you have met our needs, that we have the health and strength to be here, Lord, that you have blessed us to have the means to be here, that you've provided for our needs. <coughs> Father, you are good to us. You are good to all the world, even the unrighteous, that you cause the rain to fall upon even in their unrighteousness and rejection of you, you are a good God. And as we gather here this morning, we just pray that you would fill our hearts with wonder and admiration, that we might be able to worship you in a way that is pleasing, and that we might honor you with a, a heart that is willing to hear the gospel and be moved by the truth that is presented and to worship you in a meaningful way. And so we come before you this morning and just ask for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand. Jesus, let your kingdom come here, let your will be done here, Jesus, there is no one greater, you alone are saved.
King of heaven, come down. King of heaven, come down. Let your glory reign, shining like the day. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, rise up. Who can stand against us? You were strong to save. In your mighty name, King of heaven, come. Your glory.
be seated. You may not know this man here. This is Foz. I had asked Neil what his real name was today. I've known Foz for quite a number of years, but didn't know his real name. But uh, Foz is a retired chaplain with the military, and so I've asked him to come and read the scripture and lead us in prayer this morning. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. morning. It's great to be here. Thank you, Terry, for this opportunity to share God's word with all of you. We're going to hear from Matthew, or correction, Mark, chapter 4, starting in verse 1 through to 20. Parable of the Sower. I'll be reading you from the New International Version as well. So let's open our hearts and minds to what God will reveal to us through his word this morning. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. Well, all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables. And in his teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell among the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched. And they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. And then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parable. He told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. But to those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that they may ever may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Then Jesus said to them, Don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes them away, takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, Hear the word, the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like the seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. May God add his blessing and our renewed understanding to this reading of his holy word. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's join our hearts and minds together in prayer. Let's pray. Gracious and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you. Thank you for this beautiful, beautiful day. And thank you for this opportunity to come together as brothers and sisters in you. To come together and to worship your holy name, to sing your praises, and again to give you thanks for your many, many blessings. Lord, we hear from your word this morning, and we pray that as your word, the seed, falls in our lives, that they would be bountiful lives for you. That we would be emboldened and strengthened by your Holy Spirit 
to share your good news with all those around us. Help us to be weary, Lord, weary of, of the pitfalls and distractions of this life that would prevent us from having a bountiful harvest for you. Lord, make us wise, guide us, and strengthen us. Gracious God, we come before you knowing of your goodness, trusting in your goodness, and in that we seek your intervention, your action in this world, through us and through others. So we pray for this fallen world of ours. We pray for peace, and we're bold to pray for peace in a world where there is no peace. And we would pray that we would be those agents of peace in our homes, in our communities, in our church, and in our country. So we pray for peace. We pray too, Lord, for those who seek to keep the peace, sometimes to make peace. We pray for our Canadian soldiers. And we lift them up before you now for protection, that you would put a hedge of protection around them and keep them safe wherever they might be, whether here in Canada, deployed overseas, wherever. Just be with them and protect them. And in all things, whether they're fully conscious of your love and grace or not, that they would seek you out in the midst of trials and tribulations. Just be with them. Make yourself known to them. We pray for their families, that their families are strengthened in these times of absences, that the families again would seek you and that there would be faithfulness in these absent times. And that in all things, as we seek you, God, as they seek you, that there would truly be joyful reunion when they come together again. So to hear our prayer for our Canadian forces and soldiers. We take time now, Lord, to lift up before you the thoughts and desires petitions of our hearts and minds. So Lord, in your gracious goodness, hear our thoughts, those spoken aloud and those said in the silence of our hearts. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, we lift up before you today those who are in need of your healing spirit and your healing presence. Be with those that we know of, our, our friends, our family members who need healing in their minds, their bodies, their souls. Be with them and heal them. And we gather all these prayers together, those spoken and aloud and those said in silence, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please stand. Oh, sovereign God, oh, majesty, the sins that do Stop her. 
praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit, three in one, clothed in power and in grace, the name above all other has made me whole. Your word, my heart, has welcome home. Now feed my water and your flow. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit. Let's take our Bibles and turn over to Mark chapter 4 together. Mark chapter 4, the parable of the sower. Mark chapter 4, and we'll be focusing on the first uh, 20 verses together this morning, which means we're not doing them in detail, but we will be looking at this particular parable together. Now, in Mark chapter 4, I want you to notice, first of all, that Jesus has moved from the synagogue and from the house where he was teaching, and he goes down to the seashore. And so he's changing his location here. He's leaving the buildings, and he's going, and he's beginning to teach and to preach in the open air. There's a great crowd that gathers around him, and he begins to teach the crowd uh, using parables. Uh, Jesus has been teaching up to this point, He certainly teaches when they accuse him of blaspheming against the Holy Spirit, but this is the first time in chapter 4 that we see him intentionally teaching and training his disciples. So try to picture the scene in your mind. 
Uh, Jesus is down by the water and there's a great crowd. Uh, he's in a boat and he's teaching the people as, uh, as they're gathering in that place. Now, Mark chapter four has a series of four parables that Jesus teaches to the people. There's the parable of the sower that we'll be looking at this morning. Then there's the parable of a lamp under a basket. There's a parable of the seed growing and the parable of the mustard seed. So we're looking at the parable of the sower. But I think the question we have to ask ourselves, even before we begin to look at this parable, is what is a parable? Uh, we use the word often, and at least in the church we use the word often, uh, but what actually is a parable? Well, the word parable is made up of two different Greek words. There's the Greek word uh, balin, which means to throw, and there's the word para, which means alongside of. So literally, a parable means to throw something alongside of something else. So the idea here is that Jesus is putting something alongside of something else in way of contrast or comparison. Jesus has a spiritual truth that he wants to teach the people. So he takes a story and he throws it alongside of that spiritual truth. And his intention, of course, is to make something spiritual uh, clear to the people so that they can understand it. So a parable is an illustration that helps us to comprehend that which is incomprehensible. It helps us to penetrate that which is impenetrable. And so Jesus is speaking here using parables for understanding. A common definition of a parable is that it's, a, it's, a, it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. So Jesus is using earthly stories because he wants to teach us divine truth. Now, why did Jesus use parables? Why did he choose this method of communication? Well, we actually could spend an entire sermon uh, exploring that question. We're not going to do that, but we could actually spend a sermon exploring that question. Um, but I want to just mention briefly a number of reasons why Jesus teaches in this way. Uh, first of all, Jesus uses parables for the simple reason that he wants people to understand. He's teaching people profound truths, and he wants to make sure that the people understand the profound truths that he is teaching to them. And so he weaves the spiritual truths into common, everyday experiences. Many of the people in this crowd probably couldn't read and couldn't write, but they were very familiar with the world in which they lived, the agricultural world in which they lived. Uh, so Jesus looked around him, and he taught them using common images, seeds and farmers, water and bread, sheep and goats, fields, weeds, all of these kinds of, of images, mustard seeds, oil lamps, baskets, cities, everything that people, that they're familiar with all of these things. They just have to open their eyes and, and look around. So he's looking around and he's looking for simple illustrations because he wants to communicate these profound truths to people. So that's one reason why he used parables. He wanted people to understand what it was he was saying. Secondly, uh, he used parables because this was the common means of communication by the rabbis in that day. Jesus is not introducing a new method of teaching when he uses parables. The people would have been familiar with parables. They would have listened to their rabbis. They would have used parables to communicate truth to them. Now, Jesus had a greater authority, they acknowledged that, and certainly he was, he was teaching deeper and fuller truth to the people, and he drew the crowds, but his method of teaching was really no different than the method that was used uh, by the rabbi. So it was very, very common. It was a well-established form of teaching. Thirdly, the reason why Jesus used parables was to cover the truth from spiritually dull-witted people. He actually used parables to cover up the truth, to prevent certain people from understanding what he was saying. And we see this in chapter 4 and verse 10. It says, And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables, and he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables. In other words, they don't understand what I'm saying. They don't understand the parables. Everything's in, uh, in parables and, and it's incomprehensible to them. 
He said, they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. So parables not only were used to communicate truth clearly, but they were also used to hide the truth from those who were spiritually dull with it. So my prayer this morning is that none of us in this room will be spiritually dull with it. I know you're probably thinking I should say dim-witted, but dull-witted is the word I'm intentionally choosing. And uh, so I hope that that's not what we are here this morning, and that we're, our minds are open to hearing the word of God as it is proclaimed to us. But fourthly, and ultimately, I think, the purpose of a parable is meant to lead the listener to make a decision in their life. As Jesus communicates truth through parables, he wants people to, to look at those parables, to hear what he's saying, and then make a decision. What change do I have to make in my life in light of the truth that is being spoken to me here? One writer said this about parables. A parable is like a weapon in the hand of a speaker. It can function as a shield to divert criticism and turn the tables on an adversary, or it can sink a thought-provoking shot into the mind and heart of the audience, causing a change of outlook and attitude, confronting the listeners with a decision that needs to be made. So, so parables are heart-searching stories, and they're meant to reveal our hearts, to show us what we really are before God, and they're meant to lead us to make some kind of decision whether it be a decision of repentance or, or faith or whatever it might be, we're meant to respond in, in some way. So even as we look at this parable here this morning, we have to ask ourselves, what am I to do about this teaching? How does this apply to me? What decision do I have to make in my life? What changes have to be brought about in my life as we look at this particular parable? So we're looking at the parable of the sower here this morning. Now, as we look at the parable of the sower, I want you to notice, first of all, that there are four hearts that are represented here, four different human hearts. There is the hard heart. Secondly, there is the shallow heart. Thirdly, there's the worldly heart. And fourthly, there's the fruitful heart. So we have a hard heart, we have a shallow heart, we have a worldly heart, and we have a fruitful heart. So let's look at these four hearts uh, one after the other. So first of all, we want to look at the hard heart. And we see the hard heart in chapter 4 and verse 4. Jesus said, And as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. And then he interprets it in verse 15, where he says, And these are the ones along the path where the word is sown, and they hear, when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. So the sower is one who spreads the word. In the ancient world, they didn't kind of work the fields the way that we do and line them up in rows and, and plant one seed at a time. The sower had a bag of seed, he walked and he spread the seed, spread the seed as he was going. And some of it would fall on, along the side of the field that was uncultivated, it was hard. And so some of the seed was in, the birds would immediately sweep down and would snatch away uh, the seed. Uh, even this morning as I was here early and I was walking around just meditating in the parking lot, I looked up and there were these two beautiful hawks just hovering around the church there. You know, I, I was just thinking about the poor little critter down below that was going to get it shortly. But they're just hovering, waiting to just come down and snatch something up. That's the picture we have here. The seeds fall upon, upon the hard soil and, and, the, and, and, and the bird is hovering and it's just waiting to snatch up the seed immediately after the sower uh, casts it into the field. Now the immediate group I think that Jesus has in mind here are the scribes, the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders at that particular time. Because when we look at most of those leaders, their hearts were baked hard with sin. You know, we've all seen the pictures of desert land that has not had water. I'm not talking about the sandy desert, but the hard, crusty surface that's broken up because there's no rain and it's all sun. Well, that's, the, that's, that's most of the Pharisees, most of the Sadducees, most of the scribes had hearts that were deeply hard, impenetrable. And so when the seed of the word fell upon their hearts... Uh, Satan very quickly came and he snatched it away. And how do we know that? Because when, when they listened to Jesus preach, and when Jesus was scattering the seed into their hearts, what was their immediate response? To kill him. They wanted to kill him. 
And the reason they wanted to kill him is because Satan snatched the seed away and incited them to hatred against Jesus. And so we have this picture here um, in, in the text before us. You know, there's been, so, so we, we receive some insight here into the method of our enemy, don't we? Satan wants to immediately snatch the word out of our hearts here this morning. As we sit here today, Satan is, is just kind of hovering overhead and he's waiting to snatch this word out of your heart so that you will have no response to it whatsoever. You know, there's been talk in, in recent years of banning the Bible because it's considered by some, by a growing number of people, to be hate literature. And you hear this more and more, the Bible is being put into this category of hate literature. For example, I mean, the Bible teaches there are two genders, male and female. The Bible teaches us that there's only one legitimate relationship in which there can be sexual expression, and that's in the context of a marriage between a man and a woman. The Bible teaches us that there's only one way to God, and that is through Jesus Christ. And people hear those things, and they say, that's, that's hate literature. That's hate what you're saying when you speak in that way. The Canadian Human Rights Act, Section 3 of the Canadian Human Rights Act, prohibits discrimination based on race, national or ethnic origin, color, religion, age, sex, sexual orientation, marital status, family status, disability, and conviction for which a pardon has been granted. On that basis alone, there are many people who will condemn the Bible as hate speech because it does discriminate. It does discriminate based upon religion. It does discriminate based upon what we call sexual orientation. It does discriminate based upon marital status. It does discriminate here the word of God. Now, this was very real for many Christians out in Alberta recently uh, with the previous Albertan government. Um, the battle, a quote here, the battle uh, river school division, a school division in the western province of Alberta has ordered Cornerstone Christian Academy to refrain from reading or studying any scripture that could be considered offensive to particular individuals. You have to cut a lot of the Bible out, quite frankly, if you want to follow that. One chair member claims that human rights legislation prevents religious schools from teaching what a child or a parent might find offensive. Now, with the recent election in Alberta, I think they've got a reprieve now. I think that that'll be set aside for the time being. Um, but this is, this is the point. This is the method of the enemy. This is satanic. All, all of this has a satanic origin. Satan wants to snatch the word out of people's minds. He doesn't want the Bible read publicly. He doesn't want the Bible taught to children. He doesn't want the Bible, Bible taught to young people. He doesn't want adults to hear the Bible, to hear the message of the Word of God. He wants the Bible condemned as hate literature. He wants it outlawed. He doesn't want it to be part of Canadian society because he's a bird of prey. And he wants to snatch the Word aside, he'll do, and he'll do whatever he can to prevent the seed of the Word from penetrating people's hearts. So immediately, when the Pharisees heard of the teaching of, of Jesus, Satan snatched the seed out of their hearts, and they went on the offensive. They wanted to shut Jesus down. We don't want you spreading this word. We don't want you preaching this word to people. We, we don't, we don't, we, we, we're, and so they want to kill him. They want to shut him up. They want to stop him from spreading that seed, from preaching, from teaching. Well, quite frankly, the spirit that motivated the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the early religious leaders is the same spirit that drives the agenda in our society today. Same spirit, same satanic spirit is what's driving those who want to cast the word out and to uh, set it aside as hate literature. Now, I've sort of emphasized the, the negative response that the response of those who become very hateful towards the Bible and its teaching and towards Christians, but it's very, very important to recognize that not everyone who has a hard heart, not everyone where the seed is snatched away will respond violently or offensively against the word of God. Many people hear the word of God and they give no response to the message and they just continue in a state of spiritual lethargy. They don't care about religious questions. They don't care about eternal questions. Oh, when they, they might hear the word of God from time to time, but there's no real response. They're nice people. They don't want, they want to get along with everybody. 
You know, they're not attacking Christians. They don't want to outlaw the Bible. They just want to get along with everybody. But the Bible has zero impact upon their lives. They're fence sitters. They are non-committal. And this attitude of fence-sitting and non-committal to the gospel is as dangerous, if not more dangerous, than the violent response that is often given to the Word of God. And Satan is content with either response. Whether you respond with hatred towards the Word of God, or whether you respond with spiritual lethargy, ah, you know, you do what you want, I'll do what I want. Let's just everybody be happy and get along. Satan's happy with both responses. Because both hearts are hard and the word of God is unable to penetrate the surface. So that's the first heart. There's the hard heart. Now you might be here this morning and you might fall into this category. You might have a hard heart. And Satan is going to snatch the word away from you uh, even immediately after you hear it. But that's the first one. Doesn't penetrate, doesn't get into the heart, brings about no change, no response unless it's a response of, of rejection of some sort. Secondly, we have the shallow heart, and the shallow heart is in verses 3 to 6, and it says, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Other seed, verse 5 rather, fell on rocky ground, where it did not have much soil. So that's a shallow heart, there's not much soil. And immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. And then verses 16 and 17 give us the interpretation of that. And Jesus says, and these are the ones sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. So this is a different response because in this case, this group of people, they hear the word of God and there's an immediate positive response to the word. They accept it the first time that they hear it. You know, I'm sure that, you know, there are different types of people. This is maybe a a young person sort of thing, but if you picture a group of young people going to a lake, a lake they've never been to before. And they look at that lake, and it's very inviting, it's a hot day, and they want to jump in. You you have several types of people that are going to be there. There's always the one guy who just jumps in without thinking. He doesn't think about the rocks that might be close to the surface, doesn't think about the old beams that might be jutting up from the bottom. You know, he doesn't think about the pack of piranhas that are ready to eat him. You know, he doesn't think about anything. He just jumps into the water without thinking. There's always those guys. Then there are those who who look at the water, they want to jump in, but they're a bit more cautious, so they look at the surface, see if there's any rocks, see if there's anything they're going to hurt themselves on if they jump in, and they inspect it for a while, and then they jump in. And then there are those who just will never jump in. You know, they're just, they're not going in the lake, nothing can, can give, but you have different people who respond in different ways. Well, those who have the shallow heart are like those who immediately jump into the lake without even thinking. This is it. This is what I've been looking for. They jump in and they accept it the moment that they hear uh, the message proclaimed. So there are many people who might go to church and they might hear the preaching of the word. And when they hear the message, they say to themselves, that's it. That's what I've been looking for. My heart is sad. My heart is broken. This is the message. This is what I need. This is what is missing in my life. They hear the word and on a certain level they receive the word and they believe this to be true. And and there begins to be a change in their lives. They begin to reform their life. They go home and they say, "Uh oh, I need to commit myself to this. And they begin to read the Bible and they begin to go to church regularly. And people around them will even say, his life has been changed. He's not the man he was. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't get drunk now. He doesn't go out doing drugs now. He's, he's living you know, a, a good life. They see the change. He's reforming everything. That's the picture we have here. That he's accepted it very rapidly. And there's a transformation that is taking place um, in his life. And, and the text says, not only does he accept the word immediately, but he accepts it with joy. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a joy and a peace and a happiness that enters into his life. And you can see that he smiles more and there's a sparkle in his eye because he's found what it is he's looking for in the word of God. So there's a change, a joyful change, a happy change in the life of this one who comes and 
accepts this word. The problem here is that they sought the good aspects of Christianity, but they failed to understand the difficult side of the Christian life. They looked at it and they thought, this is what I need. This is what will make me happy. This is what will keep me, you know, in a good place for the rest of my life. And that's what they saw. But what they didn't see or hear were the words of Jesus when he said, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. So people begin to reject the faith, this newfound Christian faith, when the reality of Christianity begins to set in. They thought the Christian life would just be a easy, continual, joyful experience. Not realizing that if you are to follow Jesus Christ, that you need to die to your sin. You need to put sin to death in your life. You need to struggle against sin. You need to daily repent of your sin, confess your sin. You need to daily renew your faith in Jesus Christ. They didn't think about that hard part where they had to kill sin in their life. They didn't realize that their livelihood might be threatened because of their service to Jesus Christ. They didn't realize that some of their family members would begin to criticize them because they were serving Jesus. You know, they didn't realize that people would now begin to oppose them because of these new Christian views that they're adopting into their life. And, and then when they start to experience that opposition from the world around them, they stop and they're like, well, hold on a second. This isn't what I signed up for. You know, I, I entered into this because I was looking for joy and I was looking for peace and I was looking for prosperity. I was looking for good things. I wasn't willing to lose my job. I wasn't willing to lose friends. I wasn't willing to upset my family. And so when they begin to experience those realities, what happens is they begin to f fall away. They didn't count the cost. They didn't really understand what it meant to follow Jesus Christ. They did not know that God brings his people to glory through suffering. That God intentionally brings trials and difficulties into the lives of his people and uses those to transform them. God purifies his people through fiery trials. Now, what is the real problem with this man? This man with a shallow heart, what's his real problem? Well, his real problem is that his heart has not been changed. The problem is with the heart, isn't it? One with a hard heart, the problem is with the heart. And the problem with the shallow heart, well, it's with the heart, isn't it? That's where the problem is. His heart has not been transformed. He's reforming his life, and there's been changes in his life, changes that people can see, but his heart has not been changed. It's like buying an old house. You might buy an old Victorian-style mansion that's in a state of disrepair. And when you buy the house, you begin to mend the house. You change the windows and put new windows in. You, you put new siding. You replace the roof. You, you, you begin to, to, to paint it and, 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 and plant flowers around it and, and work on the outside of the house. And people will look at the house and, wow, that house is transformed. When I looked at that house, uh, you know, six months ago, it looked like it was going to fall down. But, but look at all the changes that have taken place in this house. And, and, then, and, then, and then three weeks later, it falls down. You say, well, why did it fall down? Well, because the house was reformed externally, but they did nothing on the inside. They didn't fix the foundation of the house that was crumbling. They didn't fix the structure that was decaying. They just began to work on the outside. The problem with this man is he has reformed his life, but his heart has not been transformed. His heart was not changed. And ultimately, that can't stand. Eventually, that life is going to fall if it's only an outward transformation. So they're happy to follow Jesus in the sunshine, but they're unwilling to follow Jesus through the storm. You know, they're happy to follow Jesus when the winds are blowing really nicely and it's cool, but they're not willing to follow him when the storm clouds begin to grow dark and it threatens of difficult times to come. Many will follow Jesus if Jesus will shine his faith, face continually upon them, but they leave him when he hides his face and he brings sorrow and trial and difficulty and suffering into their life. I mean, even Charles Darwin turned from the faith in part because his daughter died. What kind of God would let my daughter die? It was the suffering, it was the trial that demonstrated there was no reality to the faith of this man. 
And so people will follow Jesus in the sunshine, but not in the darkness. They want the sweetness of Christianity, but they don't want the bitterness. And there is a bitterness that comes with it. There is a bitterness of life that enters into uh, the Christian reality. Just as fire reveals the quality of gold, so trial reveals the quality of faith that a man or a woman has. And in this case, this man, because it was shallow, his heart was shallow, there was no root, the persecutions, the trials, the difficulties ultimately caused him to fall away. I don't want this. I don't want Jesus. I don't want this life. There's suffering in this life. I don't want this. And then he turns away from the truth. The fact is, his heart needs to be changed. His heart needs to be transformed. God needs to do something in the heart of that person if they're going to truly believe. And a man cannot transform his own heart. You cannot transform your own heart. Only God can change your heart. Only God can, 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 can dig up that bedrock and break it up and deepen the soil and transform you. And, and it, that's very clear in, in Ezekiel, for example. Ezekiel said, and this is God speaking. Notice how many times it says, I will. Not you will, but I will. You know, and I will give you a new heart. You don't give yourself a new heart. I will give you a new heart and, and a new spirit. I will give you a new spirit. I will put it within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you. I will cause you to walk in my ways. God has to change the heart. A man can't change his own heart. God has to, by his spirit, reach into the heart of this man and transform him. Unless the man with a stoning heart has his heart changed by God, he will never bear any real fruit because he'll never be converted and he will fall away. And when people fall away, it's evidence that they never truly believed in the first place. You know, the reality is this, putting it back into the context of where Jesus is preaching, Jesus is not impressed with the crowds because Jesus knows the vast majority of people that are listening to him preach have shallow hearts. And that ultimately when Jesus was going to teach them what it really meant to follow him and what it meant to die to self and live for Jesus, the vast majority of them fell away. We see that, right? When you read the Gospels, most of them didn't follow Jesus. There was only 120 on the day of Pentecost. What happened to the crowds? Shallow hearts. They didn't want to suffer for Jesus. They didn't want to accept the persecution for Jesus. And so ultimately they fell away. Thirdly, we have the worldly heart. And the worldly heart we see here in verse 7. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds, and, no, and then we have the interpretation of that in verse 18 and 19. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, word, but the cares of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things. That's why I call it a worldly heart. These are the things this heart really desires, riches, the world, things. They enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. So who is this man? Who is worldly heart? You know, we see that there is hard heart, and we see that there is shallow heart, but who is worldly heart? Who is this man, this woman that we're talking about here? Well, first of all, we see that he heard the word. He heard the, they all heard the word. Those with a hard heart heard the word. Those with a shallow heart heard the word. And those with this worldly heart heard the word. So we're not talking here about those who have never heard the word of God. We're not talking about those who live in countries where the gospel has not been preached or locations or tribal areas or, or, or cities or wherever it is where people don't know the gospel, where they have not heard the word. That's not who we're talking about here. We're not talking about those who have never heard the Bible, have never heard the name of Jesus Christ. The worldly heart would include all of those who have heard the gospel in one way or another. It certainly includes those who've heard the gospel on television or radio, even though often on television it's a skewed gospel, I get that, but you may have heard the truth in that way. It consists of those who have attended church or Bible study, and they've been confronted with the truth of the word. It includes those who regularly attend church or even semi-regularly attend church. They've heard the word of God. They've sat under the teaching of God's word. They've heard it proclaimed. Maybe they've heard a personal word of testimony. They've heard the word of God. They've heard the gospel. That's the first thing that we can say about the, the one with the worldly heart. But the second thing we can say is there's no change in his life whatsoever. There's no joyful acceptance of the word like the one who had the shallow heart. In this case, there's just no change. 
They hear the word and they seem to receive the word. They say they receive the word, but there's no response whatsoever. There's no transformation. There's no indication that the life has in any way changed. Many worldly hearts attend church regularly. They hear the word of God proclaimed week after week. They sit in a pew or they sit in a chair. They sing the songs. They hear the message. But that's the extent of their commitment. When they go home, their life is no different than the lives of those around them. There's, there's, no, there's, no, there's no desire to follow Christ throughout the week. The only thing that really distinguishes them from other people is the fact that they might go to church on Sunday. But there's no change. You look at their life today and five years down the road and 10 years down the road, and there's no change. There's no, there's no desire for holiness. There's no, there's no desire for repentance in their life. There's no growing, increasing love for Jesus. There's no increasing desire to see people one to Christ. There's none of that. But they're still sort of listening to the word. They're still maybe attending a church and, and, and thinking they're a Christian, professing they're a Christian. But there's no change in their life. There's no fruit whatsoever in, in, in their lives. Their Bibles collect dust throughout the week. And yet they go to church on Sunday. They don't really know the word of God. When you speak with them, you, can, you know there's something lacking. You know there's something missing. You, can't, you don't sense the presence of the Spirit. You don't sense this love for God when you're speaking with them because, because their hearts are worldly. Now, I want you to note, note here, what are the thorns that choke the word? What are the thorns that prevent this word from growing in the heart of this worldly man? Well, there's three things. The cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. Now, this is difficult. And what makes this difficult is that none of these things are inherently wrong. In other words, there are cares in this world, and we should be concerned about those things. I mean, we, we should be concerned about our families, and we should be concerned about shelter, and we should be concerned about paying our rent and our mortgages. We do need to be concerned about food and clothing. We do need to be concerned about doing a good job. We do need to be concerned about caring for the people around us. There are many legitimate things that, that we need to be concerned about. Not excessively worry about, we know that's sin, but, but we concern ourselves with many, many different things. We're main, concerned about maintaining health, concerned about caring for our parents when they're old, concerned about caring for our children when they're young. I mean, the list could go on and on and on and on. Life is filled with concerns, and there's nothing wrong with that. That's what life is, is caring for things. And there's nothing inherently wrong with money. Every single one of us here this morning has money. We, we work to make money, to provide for ourselves. And we all have enough money where we enjoy some luxuries and we enjoy some good things in our lives that we don't actually need. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing inherently wrong with that. That's what makes this so difficult, is that the things that we need to be careful about are the very things that we legitimately pursue and legitimately need. And so there's a real, there's a real danger here as, as you look at this particular particular heart. We know that adultery is wrong. You know, we know that, that stealing is wrong. You know, we know that lying is wrong. We know that murder is wrong. There's wrong. There's, there's no questions on that. That's black and white, but this isn't because we're talking about things that, well, it is black and white, but I mean, in the sense that it's difficult to, uh, to, to, to deal with because these are the material things of life that we're dealing with every single day. How do you know how do you know if the cares of this world are choking the seed in your life? How do you know that the deceitfulness of money is choking the seed in your life? And Paul said to Timothy, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation. Do you desire to be rich this morning? If you desire to be rich this morning, be careful because the seed may be choked in your life. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. You know what's interesting about the young rich ruler? You know the young rich ruler that came to Jesus and asked him, what must I do to, to get eternal life? And Jesus told him to obey the commandments. And he said, I've done that since I was a child. And then Jesus told him, sell all you have and give it to the poor and come follow me. And he went away sad because he loved his money. You know what's interesting about that young man? That young man had given into the deceitfulness of wealth. He loved money, but he was still a religious man. I, I imagine he still went to synagogue. He, he still probably read the Old Testament scriptures to his family. I'm sure he was noted as a religious man in his community. 
And yet, and yet the word of God was choked in his heart because of the deceitfulness of wealth and privilege and position and all that this world has to offer us. So there are those who the word is choked, but they're still in the religious community. Now, there are others who abandoned it altogether. Paul said, for Demas in love with this present world has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Certainly there are those where the word is choked where they leave. That's clear cut. They've left. But it's not so clear cut when the person is religious and they attend a church, even semi-regularly. That's not so clear cut. Maybe you need to look at your heart to see if, if, you, truly, if you truly are in the faith or if the word has been choked in your life. But then finally, we have the fourth heart here, and that is the the fruitful heart. Notice in verse 8, And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And then if you look over at verse 20, it says, But those who were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. This heart has been prepared by God to receive the truth. God has worked the soil of that heart. He has pulled the stones up from the soil of that heart. He has made the lines that we like to create in our gardens to receive the seed. This heart has been prepared by the Spirit of God to receive the Word of God. And so when they hear the Word of God, they respond. And they receive that word, they accept that word, and their heart is changed. And their life is genuinely changed as well. God opens their heart to believe the message. The truth sinks deep down into the soil of their heart. It's not on the surface where Satan can snatch it away. It's not just under the surface, but it's deep down into the heart where it's able to remain and grow and ultimately bear fruit in the life. There's a permanent change. They begin to love Jesus. They begin to love his word. They begin to love the people of God. You see this growing concern for the lost. And you see that not only has their life changed, but their whole, their whole heart direction has been changed. And there's evidence that the Spirit of God dwells within them because they love holiness. They hate their sin. They want to repent. They want to confess their sin to God. They want to be rid of that. They want to be more like Jesus. And they're seeking Jesus and looking to the Word of God and crying out to God. There's a real change, a real transformation in the heart of this one. And they begin to bear fruit 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. And it begins to spread. I was speaking with somebody the other night. And uh, we have no idea as Christians how fruitful our lives actually actually will be. Because the the fruit of our lives will continue for centuries, if Jesus tarries, for centuries in the lives of those that we've influenced now. And and when it talks about bearing fruit a hundredfold, you might not even, there have been missionaries that have gone into communities and spent their lives preaching the gospel and have not seen one convert. But then when they die, the whole village comes to Jesus. When the next missionary comes in, and his job is easy, right? He just goes in and preaches and people respond. Well, that fruit, that fruit will go for for generations and centuries forward. And so the one whose heart has been changed, who loves Jesus, who's serving Jesus and reaching out to others, the fruit just grows 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold and beyond in in the lives of, of other people. You know, the one thing I think we can, we can take from this as a church as well is that a church that is faithfully preaching the gospel should expect mixed reactions from people. There are some people that will hear the word of God and their hearts will be hard. Satan will snatch away the seed and they will leave. They might become angry with Christianity or they might just become spiritually lethargic and not care, but they'll leave. There'll be others that will come into our midst and they will hear the word of God and they will say, that's it, that's what I want, that's what's going to change me and they'll receive it for a time and six months, nine months, a year, a year and a half, two years later, they're gone. They've rejected the faith. That's going to happen. And there are going to be others that will come and they seem to receive the word, you know, and they, they come but there's no real change. You, you, do, they, do they know? Do they, do they not know? There doesn't seem to be... That's going to happen. But there are also going to be those who are going to hear the word of God They're going to be born again. Their hearts are going to be transformed. Their lives are going to be transformed. And we're going to see them bear fruit in their life. 
And we need to be careful as a congregation that we don't, we don't keep our eyes focused on the first three groups. We need to focus on the lives of those that God has truly changed. Otherwise, we'll be discouraged. We discourage ourselves when we focus upon all that have fallen away. We need to focus on those who've been transformed and pour our lives into those who have truly come to God through faith in Jesus Christ. Our job is to scatter seed. We can do nothing to change the heart of a human being. Nothing. Doesn't matter. We can play music in the background like some churches do to stir people up emotionally. That changes nothing. Nothing. We scatter the word like a farmer, just a bag of seed, just scattering the word wherever we go, telling people about Jesus and trusting that the Spirit of God will do his work in the hearts of those that we speak to. So in conclusion, let me ask you the question that I think we should ask, what kind of heart do you have? What is your heart here this morning? Do you have a hard heart? Has Satan snatched the seed away from you? Do you have a shallow heart? Have you received this message with joy, but you're not willing to pay the price to follow Jesus and to suffer for Jesus? Or, or, or do you have that worldly heart? where you're still drawn towards the money and drawn towards the success and drawn to the things of this world and they have priority over the things of God. You know, you're ready to throw off the worship of God's people every time something better comes up. Or is, has your heart been changed? Do you have a fruitful heart? Has God changed your heart through faith in Jesus Christ? Have you truly confessed your sin to God? Have you truly repented of your sin? Have you truly received Christ into your heart? Can you truly say that God, the Holy Spirit, dwells within you? That you have been changed? And that you're going to serve Him? And you're going to walk, live your life for Him? Is that who you are? These are questions that we all need to ask ourselves and answer. These are the eternal questions, the questions that really matter most. Let's pray together. Father, as we bow in your presence, we, we do pray that your spirit would search our hearts this morning. We pray that there would be nobody here today where Satan would snatch away the seed. We pray, Father, if there are sharp, sh shallow hearts, that your spirit would just break up the rock, Father, and deepen the soil. We pray, Father, if there are any who have these worldly hearts, and Lord, we are all drawn towards worldly things. But if there are those, Father, who are there in that place of worldliness, may today be the day that you just pull back the weeds and deepen the soil and work the soil so that the seed would grow and bear fruit. And we pray, Father, that each one of us would have this fourth heart, this fruitful heart, this heart that receives the gospel, this heart that is changed. Father, do this work by your spirit in the hearts of each one that are here today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dale, as we sing, could you close us in prayer, brother? Sure. Please stand.
And now let's go to the next song. There is strength within the sorrow. There's beauty in our tears. You meet us in our morning with the love that cast out fear. You are working in our waiting, sanctifying us. When beyond our understanding 
with beating us to trust your plans are still to prosper we have not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the blood you're faithful forever perfect in love we must love it all the right you are wisdom on imagine could understand your way ringing high above the heaven reaching down an endless way you're the lifter of the lowly compassionate and kind you surround and you uphold me and your promises are my delight your plans are still your promise to me I have not forgotten now you're with us in the fire Faithful forever, perfect in love, we might stop it all the rocks. Even when the enemy needs for evil, you turn it for I do. Still to prosper, you have no 